try that again. There's my mic. Good morning. All right, we're going to give a special greeting to two different groups. There's a family that every week listens to these messages and watches us online in Germany. But I also just found out that there's actually a Bible study at a Home Depot in Miami uh, 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 that during their, uh, I don't know if it's their lunch or their break time, they, uh, they use these messages for their little devotion together as a church. So I want you to welcome them. Welcome this morning. We're glad. Don't stack the stuff too high. Be careful. All right. So uh, we're starting a series called Winning at Life, and we're going to talk about different Bible characters and obstacles they've overcome. You know, all of us in life sometimes have obstacles. We have things happen that are difficult. And it's one of the most common questions for me that people ask me uh, is how to overcome something or something that's going on in their life or, you know, how in the middle of a tough situation do you still have joy or how do you deal with this? And so today we're going to look at um, the story of Esther, but we're not going to look at the part that most people focus on. Um, this is the story. People love this story. It's the story of Mordecai. I, I'm hoping that by me talking about the beginning of the story today that uh, you'll go home and go, I want to read the rest of that because it's one of my favorite Bible stories because of uh, uh, things getting turned around. The guy who built the gallows to try to kill Haman and uh, ended up hanging on his own gallows. I mean, it's just a great story. And it's the story of Esther and how she became queen. So today we're going to talk about this idea of overcoming circumstances. Overcoming circumstances. And you need to know this. If you don't hear anything else today, you need to know this. God is always involved in your circumstances, even if you don't feel like he is. God is always involved, and he can, as Joseph said, he can even use what someone else meant for evil and use it for the good. The very thing you might be struggling with may be the very thing that God uses in your life to be a blessing to somebody else. Now, I have two dogs currently. But years ago, I had a dog named Skippy, and we loved Skippy. But Skippy is the dumbest dog I've ever owned in my life. I've had some smart, how many people have ever owned a dumb dog? Like, you know, the dog just wasn't smart. Did you have a dog? How many people have a smart dog? You've had a smart dog? Got it. How many people have had a dumb dog in their life? Nobody? Okay, a couple of people. I don't know what was wrong with Skippy, but Skippy just was not the sharpest knife in the drawer, okay? Um, Skippy was as dumb as a bag of hammers. And um, so one night, it's one of these nights with no moon. It's pitch black dark. And uh, I let Skippy out, and it was, I was so tired. It was like 3 o'clock in the morning. I let Skippy out back. It was one of those the glass door, closed glass door, and I think I was just leaning. You know how you do when you have to wake up and you don't want to, just leaning on the glass door. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, Skippy is going crazy. I mean, he's running around, he's growling, he's barking. I can see him running across the yard. So I'm like, oh no, there's somebody in the yard. You know, so I go walking, I grab, I think a bat or a golf club or something like I was going to do anything. And I walked out in the backyard trying to see what's going on. And over in the corner, now Skippy was kind of standing back. And I look down, and there is just a little pile of something. I don't know what it is. It's really dark, and there's just something. I don't know, it, 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 you know, if it's another dog, if it's, a, you know, what it is. You know, it's just this pile. And, I, and, and so I'm thinking, well, I'm going to grab the dog and then figure this out. And, of course, the dog would not let me grab him. The closer, I'm like, come here. And you try to start by being nice to your dog. Come here. Come, come, come here. There. And then you go forward and they back up and you're like, come here. <laughs> right? So about the time I got close to him, all of a sudden, whatever was in a pile stood up and started moving across the yard. And Skippy went crazy again, grabbed it, and ran across the yard with it and started running around with whatever this was, this animal, in his mouth. And I am freaking out. So I went and got a pool net. I had a little pool net because we had this little kid pool. I had a little pool and I'm thinking, I'm going to get whatever that animal is and get rid of it. And I look and the same thing happens again. The animal gets really still. And as I got closer, 
I realized it was a possum. Now, I don't know what you know about possums, but I really think in, in scary movies, they should use possums more often. Uh, they are the scariest looking, ugliest thing. And you need to realize one other part about this. When I was in sixth grade, one of my friends was bit uh, by a possum and had to have all the shots. And I still remember him talking about the shots in the study. So, you know, I see possum and I think rabies, death, evil animal invented by Satan. You know, all these little things that come to mind. So, so this animal then got still, and so the dog, and I'm trying to get the dog, and of course I'm, you know, I'm trying to be quiet. It's the middle of the night. So I'm taking the net, and I'm trying to get the net between, and every time I would try to get the animal, the dog would grab the possum and just move it just a little, and I kept, and I'm thinking, if I whack the dog, is that bad to whack? But I didn't, I didn't, but I wanted to. So, so anyway, so I finally, finally, the, the, the possum kind of stays still, and I was like, if I could just get, and I finally was able to grab the dog, net the possum, throw the possum over the fence, because I knew once I got him out of the yard, he would never come back, but he would tell all his possum friends, you know, not to come back. And I remember thinking, if this dog only realized that I was trying to help him, if he would have just given me a minute and, and let me take him inside and got rid of the, the possum would not come back. But the dog thought he was helping by attacking and going crazy. And here's the thing about life for so many of us. Listen, so often we don't trust God and we don't listen to God. And we think, you know, I read God's word, but that's too hard. I'm going to do my own thing. And we end up getting attacked by a possum. Not literally, but. We allow sin and we allow worry and we allow frustration and we get irritated and we allow all these things in because we think somehow we're going to fix this in our life when God is saying, just wait on me, I'm going to show you what's right. When I look at the book of Esther, the story of Esther, this is where they get the, the, the Feast of Purim. If you, if you don't know what that is, it's a Jewish celebration early in the after New Year, and it's where they celebrate basically defending themselves. It's the idea that they defended themselves, which is what happened here. But as I look at this story, I see three things for us today, and three things that might help you if you're struggling maybe with an obstacle in your life. So let's look at them. Number one, if you want to overcome an obstacle in your life, number one, look past the past. Now, I want to tell you about Esther's past, and a lot of people have skipped this. It's Esther chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. It's also, if you have an uh, iPad or whatever, but it'll also be on the screen. It's in your notes. Esther chapter 2, verse 5 to 7 says this. Now, there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jair, the son of Shimei, which I always think that whole section sounds like something from Star Wars. I'm just saying. <laughs> the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile... From Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, um, among those taken captive with Jehoiachin, king of Judah. So basically what happened, they're, they're describing the background and they're saying the Jews, the reason the Jews were where they are now is because they were taken into captivity. Now, it wasn't Mordecai himself, because Mordecai would have had to be 120, but it was probably Mordecai's grandfather who was taken into captivity, and now they were all in captivity. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, which basically you'll find out who that is, whom he had brought up because she, listen, had neither father nor mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his daughter when her father and mother died. Now, a few things we know about Esther. When people looked at Esther, they thought she was lovely. And yet Esther had plenty of reasons to complain. Now, have you ever met anybody who's beautiful until you talk to them? You think, wow, they're beautiful. And then you talk to them, and they're, rah, 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 and they're all. Listen, Esther was an orphan. Both of her parents died. We don't know how they died. I will tell you that when you were in captivity, you typically got the jobs that nobody else wanted. You a lot of times got the most dangerous jobs. So it could be that something like that happened. It could have been, we have no idea. But we know that she lost her parents. We also know that all the Jews were in a land they didn't want to be in. She had plenty of reasons to complain. 
So here's a question for us. Do you blame others for where you are today? Or do you ask God, God, what do you want me to do? Now that I'm here, what do you want me to do? I don't think Esther wanted to be where she was. I know she didn't want to be without parents. I know she had circumstances in her life she didn't like. And yet the Bible says that when people looked at her, she was beautiful. So I don't think she was going around going, Whoa, me. Man, I just, you know. You ever met somebody who talks about the past all the time? They're talking about somebody that hurt them five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, and they're, you know, they're complaining about their parents and they're 60 years old. You know, and you're thinking, you know, you, they're, they're not, you're on your own now, right? You realize that, right? There comes a point where we have to look past the past and we have to allow forgiveness. If you're struggling with tension, depression, anger, and stress, psychologists say that is a sign of unforgiveness. Now, if you enjoy those things, please, by all means, continue to not forgive whoever it is that you're hanging on to. But when you forgive, it releases that tension. It lets that go. It's the idea of saying, God, I'm not in control. And even what was evil, you could use for good. In Philippians 3, it says it this way. Brothers and sisters, I know that I have not yet reached that goal, but there is one thing I always do. Forgetting the past and straining towards what's ahead. I keep trying to reach the goal and get the prize for which God called me through Christ to the life above. Are you focused on the past? Now, one of the worst things today is distracted driving, right? And, and they talk about cell phones and all that stuff, but you don't even have to have that. I have a cousin. This is years ago before iPhones, back when they had cassette tapes. It was a little bit after 8-tracks, but not much, not much. And my cousin was driving and was trying to put the cassette tape in the radio and accidentally dropped it and reached over to grab the tape and looked down and ran off the road into a culvert, totaled her car, broke her femur. It took that long. As important as it is to pay attention and look ahead while driving, are you looking ahead while living? You can live in the present, yet plan for the future. But don't focus on the future so much that you worry, and definitely don't focus on the past so much that you can't get past it. It's okay to learn lessons from the past, but you have to live where you are and ask God, God, help me to look forward what you have. So here's my first prayer for you. I want to encourage you. God, help me to learn from the past, to forgive, and to live in the present. Rick Warren said this, what gives me the most hope every day is God's grace, knowing that his grace is going to give me the strength for whatever I face, knowing that nothing is a surprise to God. Do you believe that? Nothing surprised you? God didn't wake up this morning and go, oh, I had no idea. <laughs> I think it's so funny. Sometimes people don't want to confess sin because they think, oh, well, God will be upset. Like when they confess sin, God's going to go, you did what? Number two, count your blessings. They say most people think that if they get a little more success, they'll be happy. If they get just a little more successful. But they're discovering more and more that happiness has nothing to do with success. Actually, about 10% has to do with even your circumstances. And yet, in the middle of all this, if you look at Esther, you see somebody who, even in the middle of what she was going through, she didn't focus on that. Listen to what happened. Esther chapter 2, verse 8 through 10. I'm going to tell you why I think that she was thankful in a second. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many young women were bought, brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the hair of Haggai. Now, it's really interesting here. You've got to realize that uh, the king who was in charge was crazy. And back then, kings could do whatever. And this guy was known for getting irritated. And even, uh, not only in the Bible, but in history, he was known for just like he could all of a sudden change his mind and do whatever. And of course, that's what happened with Queen Vashti. But, so these women, are they, they don't know what's going to happen next. You know, some people are like, oh, that would be wonderful. This is the opposite of Cinderella. You don't want to go to the castle. You know, Cinderella, she's like, oh, I hope the king comes and gets me. There, you were like, oh, no, that crazy person. And so here's what happens. It continues. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. She pleased him and won his favor. 
Immediately, he provided her with beauty treatments and special food. Now, that sounds pretty good. He assigned to her seven female attendants selected from the king's palace and moved her and her attendants into the best place in the harem. So she goes, she's taken captive, and once again, she had a choice to be ungrateful, to focus on her circumstances, to focus on, oh my goodness, this crazy king, you know, and instead she said, you know, I'm just going to do the best thing I can do where I'm at. Now, why do I think she was thankful? Here's why. Because we know this part of the story. Because she remembered it. Because whoever wrote the story down, she had to tell, hey, I had beauty treatments, and I had really good food, and I had attendance. Doesn't that sound awesome, by the way? Except that the person that you might end up marrying might kill you. That's kind of a problem, right? But she's not focused on that. That's not the focus of where she's at. She was grateful. It says in Colossians chapter 2, as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, so continue to live in him. Keep your roots deep in him and have your lives built on him. Be strong in the faith, just as you were taught. And sometimes, occasionally, always be thankful. Always be thankful. So here's what I want you to do right now before we go any further today. They've actually done studies on this, and it's really funny because... They're starting to do psychological studies on thankfulness, which is hilarious because the Bible has kind of had the corner on that market for a long time. So I want you just right where you're at, I want you right where you're at to think of three things, don't say them out loud, three things that you're thankful for. Just think of three things you're thankful for. Okay, now I want you to tell the person next to you on both sides, one of the things that you thought that you're thankful for. Go ahead, go ahead, tell people that what you're thankful for. Go ahead. Now here's what I find funny about this exercise, because I watched it last night. On Saturday nights, it's, it's about 300 degrees outside this time of year, okay? We've got a few more weeks of this miserableness. I consider this our blizzard season. You people should stay inside if you can, stay off the roads and in the air conditioning. But anyway, so last night we're sitting in church and I did this. And I'm telling you, before I did this activity, they were like this. And then after you do those activities, people's facial features, they smile. They actually change. And you're looking at me now. Most of you are like, now you're like this. A minute ago, you're like. Just being thankful changes us. I want to encourage you, take time every day to be thankful. Maybe for the next week, for the next month, just write three things down you're thankful for before you go anywhere, before you do anything. Maybe when you wake up in the morning, say, God, thank you for air conditioning. And if your air conditioning goes out, God, thank you for this bed or, you know, whatever, you know. Uh, uh, thank you for friends who I can sleep at their house, okay? But anyway, Dale Carnegie says this. It isn't what you have, or who you are, or where you are, or what you're doing that makes you happy or unhappy. It's what you think about. My friend shared an article yesterday, and I decided, you know what, this goes along with the message. So I'm going to share five steps from this guy named Michael Hyatt. He said, if you wake up, you ever wake up and you just feel kind of in a funk, or you find yourself in the middle of the day for no reason, all of a sudden you feel really grumpy and irritated, and you don't have teenagers? <laughs> Put that together. All right. So here's five things. Here you go. Number one, put on some upbeat music. Music changes how we feel so often, and sometimes it even invokes memories. Number two, stand up and stretch. You know, if you're sitting and you're slumped over, and you're sitting and you're trying and you're thinking about, woe is me. You know, if you're droopy, oh, yeah, I can't remember. You know, stand up and stretch. Try to reach the ceiling. And then number three, take several deep breaths. We can do that here. Go ahead and take a couple deep breaths. Some of you haven't breathed yet today. <laughs> Nothing wrong with taking a deep breath. What happens? You know, over time you start to breathe real shallow and you, you start to slouch. And, just, and then you find yourself. And they've actually done studies that simply smiling makes you feel better. We're so weird. Number four, get your body in motion. That's the idea of taking a walk, move around, you know, do some things. If those of you sit at a desk, stand up, do something different. And then finally, focus on the positive. 
In Proverbs 3, 23, 7, it says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So often, one of the reasons that we're discouraged is not because of our circumstances. It's because of what we're thinking about. I've met people that seem to have everything, but they focus on what's wrong. And I've met people that have nothing, but they focus on what they do have and how blessed they are. It really has more to do with how we think. And then finally, live under proper authority. Now, I'm not talking about taking abuse. I'm not talking about letting somebody manipulate you or hurt you, but there is proper authority in life. And when you and I really trust God, we understand that there is authority in our life put there from God. Even Joseph, with everything he went through, he was able to say to his brothers, hey, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. So that means even if you have a boss who makes dumb decisions, even if you have a boss that does dumb things, God can even use that. Years ago, um, I was working at a church, and, and we had one of the, one of the uh, leaders came in, and they had an interim pastor, and he was taking over, and he was trying to get the staff to do things like come in on time, uh, and, you know, all the, and, try, and trying, to find, you know, trying to find out what people were doing and working and everything. So he had staff meeting. I think his staff meeting was at 8.15. And so one morning I came in and I got to my office and I always got there early and opened up my office and I got a phone call immediately and I was working with students and one of the students' friends had passed away. So I was on the phone. Well, by the time I got off the phone, I was late to staff meeting. We had about 35 staff more or less at that time at this church. And as I walked towards staff meeting, the door was closed and I thought that was odd and I went up and I grabbed the door handle and the door was locked. So I said, Okay, so I just stood outside. Of course, I was a little embarrassed. And then finally, about halfway through staff meeting, Eldon, his name was Eldon, Eldon opened the door and let me in, and I went in and sat down at the staff meeting. After staff meeting, in front of everybody, he said, can I see you in my office? I said, yes, sir. So I went to his office, and uh, uh, I don't remember what he talked to me about, but we talked for a minute, and then uh, he said, I said, uh, so, um, and, oh, I told him what happened. I said, you know, I had a phone call, blah, 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 blah. And he said, well, the reason, I said, well, why'd you lock the door? He said, well, the reason I locked the door is because when I was in college, I had a professor that when we were late, he would lock the door so we couldn't come in. And here's all I said to him. I looked at him and I said, well, Eldon, did you like that professor? He stopped for about a second. And he looked at me and he said, I'll never lock the door again. <laughs> He realized that he actually was doing something of a professor that he didn't like. And when I questioned him, he went, oh, wait a second. You can learn stuff even... And by the way, we became good friends, just so you know. But, but and his daughter goes here to church. So, tell me that's not cool. So, anyway, but you can learn something even from a boss who's difficult. Some of the best lessons I've ever learned are from bosses who were jerks. How many of you have ever had a jerk boss? Come on, I see those hands. How many of you are a jerk boss? I'm the boss and I'm a jerk. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Listen to how Esther, even in her circumstance, even with everything going on, was, was remained under authority. Listen to this. I mean, it's starting in verse 10 and skip it to 15. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background. Why? Because her uncle Mordecai, I love saying that, had forbidden her to do so. When the turn came for Esther to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the harem, suggested. So basically she said, what do you suggest I wear? What do you suggest I do? And Esther, listen to this, won the favor of everyone who saw her, which is amazing. Have you watched any of these bachelor shows? These people can't get along with anybody. Everybody's mad at them. They're just trying to win the one person. They destroy each other. But the Bible says that everyone, the favor of everyone that she saw, she was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the 10th month of Tibet in the seventh year of his reign. The king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women. Once again, she wasn't going in there going, I can't believe I have to do this. And she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And if you read the rest of the story, it saved all of the people. Why? Because she learned. She knew to look past her past. She knew that no matter what her past was, she had to live now. 
And she had to do what she was supposed to do now. She counted her blessings. She saw, even in the middle of this circumstance, hey, I'm getting beauty treatments and good food. We're going to go with it. I mean, the guy might kill me next week, but we're getting good food. Let's just go with that. And then she knew how to live under authority. In Hebrews 13, it says it this way, Obey your leaders and act under their authority. They're watching over you because they're responsible for your souls. Obey them so they will do this work with joy, not sadness. It'll help you. It will not help you to make their work hard. And this is talking about pastors, but there's also verses in the Bible that talk about even the people who govern us, even those people you don't like, God can even use them. Uh, and there's verses in the Bible actually during the time of Nero where they said, he said, live under your authority. Now, once again, that doesn't mean to go against God to obey your authority. But we have to look and learn from the people God's put over us and say, you know what, God? I'm going to be obedient. Why? Because I'm not in control. This is your last thought for today. One of the reasons that you and I get stressed out and frustrated and we consider the mountain so big is because we're tired. And one of the reasons that we're tired is because we think we control life. And we haven't taken time to recognize that God is really in charge. So have you understood that God knew your past? And have you understood that God knows your future? And do you understand that God is with you now? And if you and I will recognize that and say, God, I'm not going to try to do everything for me. I release control. You guide me. Show me. Help me to do what you want me to do in the present. You know, Jesus only gave two commands. Love God and love people. So what do you need to do today? Love God and love people. Forgive the people in the past who hurt you, who messed you. By the way, some of that's the best thing that could have happened to you. It led you to where you are now, and God's going to use that very thing, even that hurt, for you to be a blessing to somebody else. It's made you maybe a more humble person because of something that happened to you. Now, I'm not saying that what that person did was good. You can say, like Joseph said, what you did was evil. But he can use even that for the good. And then, God, I don't know what the future holds. I don't know about my health. I don't know what's going to happen next. I don't know what the finances are. I don't know what this. And you don't know what the next thing is. But you say, you know what, God, though? You're with me today, and you'll be with me tomorrow, and I trust you today. When you and I do that, it lets go of the control. You'll find yourself more at peace. You'll have that joy even in the middle of difficulty, even in the middle of circumstances that are tough. You'll be able to walk through them because you'll know his peace. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, that's the first step to overcoming in this life. And so I encourage you, if you've never surrendered your life to him, maybe you know about him, maybe you've shown up for church, maybe you said a prayer, maybe somebody sprinkled some water on your head one day, but you've never really surrendered your life to Jesus, I encourage you to do that today. I'll be here after the service, and you can say, Pastor Eric, I want to give my life to Christ. How do I do that? And I'd be glad to pray with you, because Jesus gave his all for you and for me. Also, if you're here today and you're a Christian, but you've been trying to control life, I want to encourage you today, just be honest with God. Say, God, you know what? I'm not in charge. You are. I can breathe. <laughs> and give it back to him. Any area that you're worried about or fretting about, any unforgiveness, just give it back to him. Surrender it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your wisdom. Father, I thank you for examples all through the Bible of people who overcame incredible things. And Father, we thank you for a godly woman like Esther who showed us what it means.